right. My name is Adolfo Romero. Today is April 20th, 2023. And Today I'm here on behalf of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, and I'm here with my colleague, Mason Kieser, and Adolfo Romero. And today, who do I have the pleasure to be here with today? You are interacting with Patricia Polson Satterfield, um, referred to frequently as the Honorable Patricia Polson Satterfield, referred to colloquially as Pat Polson. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Judge Satterfield. Uh, so I want to know a little bit. Let's go back to the beginnings of your family. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your family? Uh, where do they come from? Do you know your great-grandfather? Are they from Virginia or, or which areas are they from? Okay. My um, family name is Dudley, D-U-D-L-E-Y. And the, my great-grandmother, Hannah Moody, um, was the child of the cook and the property owner in Saluda, Virginia. And Hannah, which was her name, uh, she married twice. The first time she was married to a gentleman by the name of Willie Bush. And from that family line, we have illustrious individuals who came, um, including my cousin, who was the designer, Willie Smith, as well as his sister, Tukey Smith, who was the actress, who was the paramour of Robert De Niro, and they have twins, twin boys, and so forth. Um, upon Willie's death, she remarried Joshua Dudley, who would be my great-grandfather. Now, Joshua Dudley, he um, fought in the Civil War. He also was present in Juneteenth in, in Texas, and he was one of the liberators at that point in time. Um, Joshua was a very potent force here in Middlesex County. Uh, he ended up being one of the founding members of several of the black churches here in Middlesex County, uh, including First Baptist Amberg, which is in Deltaville, as well as First Baptist Homley Village, which you, have, you passed on en route here. Mm. Um, Hannah and, and uh, Joshua had a full array of children, many children. Um, and of those children, uh, most went to college. Um, my great aunt who raised my mother uh, lived here directly across from Christ Church School. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, my big mom, as we refer to her, uh, did, uh, did the shirts, cleaned the shirts for the young men who attended Christ Church School. She and her husband were founders of Calvary Baptist Church, which is, which is adjacent to um, Christ Church School here. And I was born and raised in this community knowing that the Dudley name was a name of substance. Um, and moving forward from um, just prior to my birth, uh, there was this individual, John Henry St. Clair Walker, who was very, very much an educator within Middlesex County. He was determined that black children in Middlesex County were going to be exposed to the best of education. And he spent his lifetime ensuring that would, that would happen. He was a graduate of Hampton Institute, and he recruited teachers from Hampton Institute including a young man from Cora Peak, North Carolina, whose name was Grady H. Polson. And Grady H. Polson came to Middlesex County for the purpose of teaching math and science at, at what was then known as Middlesex Training School. Now, a few years prior to that, my mother had graduated from Middlesex High School which was how the black school was, was described. 
Um, later, Middlesex County decided that that name could not be used by black families, so they changed the school to Middlesex Training School. But upon Grady's arrival in Saluda at the Greyhound bus station, he was confronted by a farmer and these two young women, one of whom was my mother. Mm -hmm. And he met, fell in love, and mm -hmm. never left, mm -hmm. except for study purposes. Saluda, he didn't last as a teacher. He was a little person. Um, he was very determined in his ways, and no one was going to tell him what to do, including the school administration of Middlesex County. So he lost that job. Um, but that's how he happened, and the Polson name happened to come to Middlesex County. Wonderful. Um, how was it growing up over here in Middlesex County when you were a kid? Do you still rem do you have good memories? How was it? I have wonderful memories. Um, I was one of the, um, as I indicated, my father had did not last in education. And he decided that he had to do something different. So that when I was an infant, he left this area and went to Howard where he took his degree in dentistry because he didn't want to spend the time taking the prerequisites to go to medical school. And once he graduated from dental school, he came back and he opened two practices, one in West Point and one in Kilmarnock, which is just north of Whitestone. Um, one in Kilmarnock, he, um, he and Dr. Mar Norris shared space in Kilmarnock, and in West Point, he and Dr. Franklin shared spaces. The county of Middlesex was not too happy to have, because he still remains to this day, so far as I can tell, the only black dentist within the Northern Neck, Middle Peninsula area, still. Um, but he, these Middlesex County was not happy, so he was drafted into the Korean War oh. in 1950, and uh, so he had to close down his practice. When he returned, he reopened here in Middlesex County, and he ultimately closed down his office here, I guess it was in 1991, 92, and retired. Okay. But in res direct response to your question, it was because of I had somewhat of a privileged background as a consequence of, of that. But we were surrounded. Middlesex County had a very vibrant, strong black community comprised of your teachers. You had other professionals. You had the entrepreneurs. Um, we were a well-developed community that was defined by our churches and by our schools. And all activities revolved around the family, the church, and the schools, and they were all interconnected. Um, Fridays within the segregated black classrooms, mm -hmm. There was always an is emphasis on black history. We knew, we knew black history. We knew spirituals. We knew about blues. And my mother, who was a musician, whose auntie who raised her was a musician. I come, come from a musical family. She saw to it that we learned all of these songs to be sung. As I indicated, and we are moving ahead to high school now, the high school teachers, many of whom were Hampton Institute graduates, many of whom did their graduate studies at Columbia, because Columbia had a very, very aggressive program for black educators from the South. Um, there was a branch, particularly from Virginia, who studied at Columbia. From the area of North Carolina, where my father was from, many of the um, teachers there, they studied in the Boston area. Um, so that um, all of our teachers, for the most part, had master's degrees. Educated, re-educated. They couldn't get any other positions, but that was okay. And they were in, in t what they, the mantra that we heard almost on a daily basis was that 
You little Negro children are going to learn everything that you need to know. Everything, everything, everything. You little Negro children. And they were intent upon filling us with that. As the musician's child, um, the parents at St. Clair Walker High School decided that they needed a band. So it was in the early 50s, I think my father was in Korea, that the parents banded together and raised money to buy musical instruments. I was in elementary school, my sister was in high school, um, but they were able to secure the assistance of um, musicians from New York, from um, Richmond, uh, a Mr. Kessler, who was a Holocaust survivor, mm. uh, organized the band, and uh, we had a Mrs. R.J. Robinson who provided piano lessons, et cetera. And we had our first ragtail parade for May Day. May, May 1st was a big day within the black community, particularly. I don't know what was going on the other side. Um, we celebrated greatly with the wrapping of the Maypole, but we had our first parade. And as an elementary school teacher, our child, my father and I grew up across from Sinclair Walker High School, just down the road a piece, would pick me up from my elementary school, take me to the high school where I would participate in learning the instruments. I played the clarinet and the saxophone. Wow. My sister was on the flute. She was on the flute, and um, um, that was our introduction to music. Um, in, within the school system, and it was a successful program. Um, at that point in time, and I know I am going on, I'm not allowing you to step in at all, I apologize for that, but there were, my recollections are, even as an elementary school st student, St. Clair Walker, which was a small high school, small, I think we had at maximum 150 students, we were competitive, and the state of Virginia had um, competitions in the sciences, in music, so we traveled for region to region of the state competing in music festivals where the band would perform, the choir would perform, and I was a, I was a singer. Um, we traveled from college campus, HBCU to college campus, to compete in the areas of science and mathematics. And Mr. Walker, who I mentioned earlier, who was the, science, the math teacher, he taught me, of course, math, and then there was geometry, and then there was trigonometry. Uh, and we competed in all of those disciplines. And we competed against the big schools in Richmond and Norfolk. And they would kind of laugh at the country bunkins as we would come up. And there was a joke would be told that Mr. Uh, Mr. Walker would put us all in the back of his old car and drive us to the various campuses. And he never got out of first gear. Mm. And we would appear on campus. And you know we were not the most sophisticated. But I can remember the first year that I competed, it was straight math and straight science. And it may have been, and I had always scored very, very well on the um, standardized test. I always did well on that. But for some reason, I got the numbering off, mm -hmm. and I, I, it was an abysmal failure. Mm -hmm. And the next year, I competed in biology and I think in um, algebra. And guess who came out number one in both? Hey. And the following year, I competed in trig and chemistry. And guess who came out statewide huh. in both? And I think my senior year, and I may have the years, I may shift. The senior year may, may have been trig and chemistry. Because and I can remember that was at Hampton University, Hampton Institute at the time. Um, so we excelled, and hopefully you will meet the person who molded me. Wow. He's scheduled to come in for a interview today, Dr. Lomax. Wow. And he came in, and his first year teaching, he came into our science class. And Sputnik, which you may be aware of, had just been launched by the Russians. He said, OK, we are going to take over Sputnik as of today. <laughs> and he proceeded to prepare us to 
to compete. Grand, grand time. We had wonderful fun. We organized our activities of the dance. We always had dramatic performances because we had to learn how to speak. Right. We engaged in oratory that was both in the church as well as in school. We always did musical productions as well as dramatic presentations. We always competed at every area that we could compete, we competed and did exceedingly well. And this was particularly the case in the minds of many as it related to athletics. And we did very, very well statewide athletically. And um, when you attended the high school, was this, what year was this? I started high school. Now, I went to Mill Road for elementary school. My mother was my first grade teacher. She gave me my first spanking my first day of school because the teacher's child could not be seen to get away with anything. So she had to discipline me. And I went through the first to the fifth grade or sixth grade, fifth grade at Mill Road School, three-room school. In the um, first and second grade were in one room, third and fourth grade were in another. It must have fifth and sixth were in another, three-room school. And um, that seventh grade, I went to another school, Syringa. And then as an eighth grader, I went to the high school, which was then known as St. Clair Walker high school. Was this during uh, desegregation already? At this oh, point, absolutely or? not. Oh, totally not segregated. Okay, so we're, totally okay. segregated. So your what was curious about this region was that um, my father, upon his opening of his office here, and he opened it um, in Middlesex County, I guess maybe in 1949. No, 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 no. He had to close it in 49 to go off to Korea. When he came back from Korea in the early 50s, when he went into opening his practice in earnest here, 90% of his, his clientele, they were white. Okay. And Deltaville is the tip of Middlesex County. And there were many um, folks from the Northeast who would travel to Florida, stop off at De Deltaville, have their dental work done by my dad on the way down and see him on the way back. And I have now a huge, huge lobster hanging in my family room that one of his patients had caught and had stuffed in Cape Cod. Um, but that was really a phenomenon. In my judgment, 90% of his patients would, would your father provide services for the black community uh, at a discount, or would he help them on the side um, if they couldn't afford it or anything on well, that he end? He was a part of a state program, Okay. and I can remember him picking me up out of school, and we would go to schools in the Northern Neck, which would be Lancaster, Northumberland, and Richmond County, and he would be providing dental services for the school children. He did the same thing in Middlesex. He also provided dental services for the, um, the Mattapanai and the Pamunkey reservations that are next to West Point, or in West Point, Virginia. So that that was all a part of his, his services. In addition to his private practice, he did the public services uh, for youth within the region. Um, and I just remember going with him from school to school and playing with the kids as he was grinding their teeth. <laughs> yes. Good point. Uh, so growing up, uh, what made you, at this point of time when you were back in high school or grammar or elementary school, when did you decide to, what, what career path did you want to take okay. down the road? When was that decision made, like, hey, this is what I want to do, I want to follow up? One of the mysteries of my being a judge is that I never could make a decision. Okay. Um, when I was, I came from a musical family, as I indicated. I think my, my big mom, who lived right over there, uh, she saw to it that all of her children, and she had none, but she raised quite a few, 
were exposed to music. So that I, my sister and I started music lessons when we may be three or four years of age. And as a consequence of the starting of the musical program at Sinclair Walker, and I mentioned a Mrs. Audrey Robinson who was giving lessons, um, my mother and others uh, would transport a group of us every week to Richmond to take lessons. My sister and I took piano and organ lessons, piano from Mrs. Robinson and organ from a Mr. Howell. And um, we were the musicians for our, I play, my sister graduated from high school. She was the musician at Calvary, which is the adjacent church here. When she graduated, I became the choral director and the musician. So that I always had a musician's background and I studied classical music the whole time I was in high school. Uh, thanks to my mom and her, her friends who saw to it that we took lessons. Um, but my father had two daughters. My older daughter, who was the child prodigy, um, it was okay that she could focus on music. But his son, me, I was going to take over his practice. So that my road was for chemistry and math. Right. And I went to Howard University as a double major in chemistry and math. But I also went there with my love of music. And um, the then director or head of the College of Fine Arts at Howard was a Dr. Warner Lawson. And I had auditioned and had been selected to perform with the concert choir of Howard University. And for my whole freshman year, he encouraged me to change my major, which I refused to do because I had a mission. Um, and then he came up with the brilliant idea. He put together a group to study in San Amon, Puerto Rico, um, with Pablo Casals, the cellist, for the summer of my freshman year. And he wanted me to attend. And my parents would allow me to go only on the condition that my older sister, who was then a working on her master's in Boston Conservatory, be permitted to join to supervise her wild child. <laughs> so we did go. And when I returned to campus, I mean, I was totally enmeshed and totally in love, first of all, with the musical climate within Puerto Rico and the traveling from one location to the other, and certainly the interaction with Pablo Casales, the cellist, that this was an area that I had to go into. How did it make you feel like the politics? Well, traveling, you know, outside internationally at this, well, not internationally since Puerto Rico, but traveling to Puerto Rico, you're getting a whole different ambiance uh, about absolutely. what reality is, absolutely. perspective, even from, you know, coming from this region. How did that make you, did it open like the gates to like uh, further thinking the way that you perceive? My these, parents, these they were wonderful, wonderful people. Okay. They were very into each other but they wanted to expose their children to as much as possible so that summers were traveling times for us. They would, wow. they would arrange for travel through AAA. My sister and I would be put in the back seat and we were the navigators. We had to take them wherever it was that we were supposed to go following the mapping that had been provided by right. AAA so that we would spend summers maybe in Canada we would spend, I can, I can remember our first trip to Niagara Falls. And again, I say that I was fortunate because I came from a background that financially could support that. And I'm saying that as a, it was a factual situation. And whatever they had, they were going to pour into their children. They may not talk to us, but they would ensure that we were exposed to as much as possible. So that it was not that novel for us to be traveling it was my first air flight mm -hmm. when I went to Puerto Rico, but it was not that unusual for my sister and me to be, you know, traveling to um, an area where people did not necessarily speak English. Right. Yeah. Did you understood at that point of time your privilege, uh, understanding that you were able to? Travel I was your embarrassed family? by it. Really. Mm -hmm. I was embarrassed by it, and I have to say that I had to become a tough, tough child. 
yeah. in order to, uh, you know, to overcome some of the, um, there was some resentment and hostility. I could feel that. But I, I, I learned how to speak in forceful tones and um, not necessarily the best of tones. So you, you survive. Right. And I was able to um, really cultivate and um, I had friends. I had yeah. friends. And I also was surrounded by children of those same entrepreneurs that I, and we had a, our parents formed what was known as a renaissance group. Mm -hmm. And they were insured, they, they, we could, we were not allowed to go to the, the integrated, and I have one experience I want to share with you in a minute. But um, they would, we would travel to D.C. to go to the movie. They would load the cars with young people, take us to D.C. to see the movie of the time. And we'd go to the Rock Creek Park. We would go outside of the area to experience what the rest of the world was experiencing. Our parents saw to that. So that we were surrounded. And again, they would take children from the community along with them. I mean, this was the middle class of Middlesex County, black middle class. And they knew they were the educated and the re-educated, and they knew what was out there. They wanted to expose all children to that, and we were. That same Renaissance Club, my father had arranged for, Porgy and Bess was the new thing. Mm -hmm. And it was being performed at the mosque in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had ordered tickets for the Renaissance Club to attend, maybe 40 or 50 tickets. He got the tickets. We all ar ar arrived in um, Richmond to the mosque. Fabulous seats, fabulous seats. And as the group poured in, and they were all of these black folks. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could, you could. I mean, I, I mean, we were all excited. I mean, the children went as well, and um, the management did not know what to do. And um, they, first of all, tried to get the group to relocate. And my father said, no, we're not moving. We have these tickets. And then they offered the people around us the opportunity to sit elsewhere. And a couple of people did. The rest said, no, we're staying right here. Mm -hmm. So that the one instance in which it could have been a very negative outcome turned out to be a very, very positive experience. We were subjected to the Jim Crowism, mm -hmm. but we overcame it. And we sat and we enjoyed watching Porgy and Best and went home giddy and happy and triumphant. Um, I think I was in elementary school then. Um, but our parents were, were fearless and they were determined. We, had, uh, we took French. I told you what the curriculum was. I and mean, we had a very broad curriculum in terms of high school. Um, and Sinclair Walker, of course, is right there at Cook's Corner, which had a whole different milieu. Um, yeah, you know, one question I have, you know, you're over here, middle class, upper middle class, doing well off, um, but yet you had the Jim Crow on the side. Mm -hmm. How were you able to reconcile both differences, you know, have it all over here as much as your parents are able to provide, but yet on the other side of society, you see that negation like of acceptance for, from the, for the community. So how were you able to deal with that? I wasn't, I mean, I was aware because um, there, we had to, the first day ritual of school was that we'd get books and we'd have to wrap them in newspaper or brown paper to keep it safe. And there would be writing on the side. I mean, someone would say, oh, the white kids, they threw those books away last year. Um, but it was a book. Right. Um, and I have really thought about this a lot. I really cannot say or identify any impairment. Mm -hmm. We were, I was a happy child. Good. Um, I only contemplated, um, no, I was, I was a happy child. We had our birthday celebrations. We had, um, we had one family that had a enormous beachfront property. We went to the beach, we did whatever. Um, we were, we felt happy going to Sunday school and going to the school and to dances and so forth. Uh, I was never subjected to, um, anything necessarily untoward. The one thing that I was interested in doing 
many of my friends during the summer, some of them would go away with their parents, many of whom lived and worked away during the year for white families. And the children would go away with the family to be nannies for the kids. Mm -hmm. And those who remained, they would be involved in the agricultural community, picking string beans, picking whatever. And I wanted to do that. And I, I begged my mother, because my close friend would do that. I begged my mother, I want to do this, I want to do that. So my mother finally relented. She said, OK, I'll let you and Jackie participate. And she went out and got us big straw hats and got us buckets and so forth. And we went to the site where we were supposed to be picking, um, I think we were picking string beans. And a half an hour in, I said, uh-uh, this is not for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I started filling the baskets with, uh, with grass and whatever, and it didn't work out too well. And the uh, owner said, who was a black farmer, he said, don't you bring those children back over here again. Mm -hmm. um, that was my one experience and, and my rejection of being a part of the agricultural sector. Um, I was fine. I was fine. I was so happy. I mean, our life was so structured right. that we went from A, B, C, D, E, and F. And um, my mother, the teacher, my grandmother did much of the cooking and whatever. And I can remember as I was making my tours from middle school, not middle school, elementary school to the high school for band and so forth, watching soap operas with her. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the first TV sh that we had. Um, I remember the first black family to have a TV in the county. Wow. The house next to Sinclair Walker High School, they had a long antenna. Um, they were happy days. Can you tell me a little bit about May Day? I know you touched a little bit about that. Uh, what did it mean to the black community having uh, May Day? Is it, was it a parade? Was well, it a festival? What initially, was you would, I would, some, as soon as warm weather struck, maybe the last part of, maybe early March, that's when the Maypoles would go up in the respective elementary schools. And we had element, most of the, many of the churches had their own schools. That was what was provided for the black community. The church provided the schools. And um, there was Antioch School that was affiliated with Antioch Church. There was Calvary that was school that was affiliated with Calvary Church. You had Shiloh School that was affiliated with Shiloh Church. You had Mount Zion School that was affiliated with Mount Zion Church. And um, so that each, at each church school ground, the Maypoles would go up. Mm -hmm. And you would start practicing the, all of the intricate steps for wrapping the Maypole because it was a competition on May Day who could wrap the best maypole. So you had to practice that. We learned square dancing mm -hmm. so that we had square dancing competitions. And we spent considerable time during recess. Our physical activity was revving up for May 1. When May 1 comes around, you would have a May Queen, a May Day Queen and King and a little ring bearer. You would have, of course, Sports, the baseball game or softball game was a major component. You would have the photo booths where you would go in and take your little, you perhaps have never seen those, but we would go in, have our little pictures taken, the black and white pictures. You would have the cotton candy that was being fun. It almost took on a carnival fair-like aspect. Within the school itself, you had the stage set for whatever the production was going to be for that particular period. And you had the, the, the various games that would be played and pin the to tail, tail on the donkey and the typical fair type of thing. And once we added the parade to it, that became a very, very important component. The day was compartmentalized, and all of the maypoles that used to be positioned on the individual ch school grounds were all transported, and you had this huge array of maypoles. And you would have the competition of the wrapping of the maypoles. And um, after the queen and the king, of course, were brought in and seated upon their throne, you would have the festivities to begin. And you ate, and you drank, and you played, and you 
um, hid behind the curtains in the... It, it seems there was a lot of cultural access back in the day and a lot of activities happening, a lot of education happening, um, a primary black history, not just that, like be pr proud, take ownership of that. Absolutely. I want to know when did it happen where things started shifting? Did it start shifting? And if so, when did it start shifting? Now, I graduated from high school in 1960. Okay. And in, up until that point, Virginia was moving forward with all deliberate speed. Totally, totally opposed to any form of integration at all. Now, St. Clair Walker High School closed down officially in 1969. So that period of, an, of, that, um, of turmoil or whatever, from 1960 to 1969, I was not a part of. What I was a part of was the fact that in West Point, the parents in West Point, um, there was a high school, Beverly Allen, and high school was there. That was the black school. And that was closed down, and there were all kinds of unrest that were going on in West Point. And parents loaded their children up, in, and they were transported to school at Sinclair Walker High School. And at Sinclair Walker High School, we had the West Point 13, 13 students. Some of them lived in the community. Some of them um, uh, commuted on a daily basis to be able to go to school in Middlesex. Mm. During that same period, there was an area of Virginia, um, um, Prince Edward, in which they closed down the school system. And one of the, because they refused, there was this young, young girl, her name was John, so her last name was John. She led this, this major protest in Prince Edward, and they um, boycotted and refused to they were trying to compel the integration. I was aware of that. One of the field trips for the Renaissance Club was to visit that region so that we would be aware of what was taking place outside of Middlesex County as it related to integration. But these were intermittent um, occurrences where we were made aware of what was going on within the state as it related to the implementation of the Brown B. Board of Education decision. Um, but my, I was not involved because I was away in college okay. and of much that was going on with this, within the community. You will be interacting with students who will live through it. Mm. So you will be interacting with students who uh, were in the first class at Middlesex High School. Um, I was aware of the devastation that my principal, who had been the only principal at St. Clair Walker High School, Mr. C.I. Thurston, uh, was offered a principalship at the middle school. I mean, everything was downgraded. I was aware of that. The, the professors, the teachers that we had that were so outstanding, they couldn't find jobs. I was aware that some of the parents who were insisting upon their children being the first two, and this started, I think, taking place around 65 or 66, they lost their jobs. Many were subjected, from what I am told, to um, some very frightening circumstances because they were seeking to um, fulfill the, the rights that are supposedly had been attained as a result of Brown v. Board of Education, so that I, as a student on Hampton, on Howard University's campus, wanted to be in that first wave of freedom riders. Mm -hmm. But Grady Post said, uh uh, you coming right back here in the middle sex. You're not going to be on any bus. You're not going to do. But I was involved in protest in Washington, D.C., and it was a more of a global protest than a localized protest. Okay. Um, I can recall coming home to visit and being engaged in heated conversation around the dinner table um, as I am critical, cri because I know it all at this point, critical of what was being done here as opposed to what could be done. Mm -hmm. um, we were very, very, and my, my group turned on the black bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. which I was a right. part of. Right. You know, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> where he turned on the black bourgeoisie. <laughs> right. So there were a lot of conflict and dynamics that were going on. My classmate was Stokely Carmichael. Yeah. Really? Oh yeah, we were classmates. So we would meet on the on the on the ground, and we would be I'd be involved in their. Um, you know, discussions and their the activisms and so forth. And but I was not permitted to act out anything. Mm-hmm. He was later known as Kwame. He do married Mary Makiba. Okay. Um, and um, the SNCC, really in a fashion, mm-hmm. had its genesis on our campus. Wow. And um, they they moved up. But I can remember waving to the buses as they went by, and wow. I was not permitted to be on the buses. But um, so it was all more of a global, global from my perspective. And I left Indiana, left Washington, um, having secured my undergraduate degree in four years. The music degree was five years. I was able to compress all of that into four years, and I left there and went to Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana, which is where I did my graduate studies in opera. But that is also the home of the Klan. Yes. So that I had my own protest on the campus of Indiana University. The black community was very, very vocal. Um, and um, my husband, who I met there and we married, we would travel by motorcycle to various areas of the area, and um, but we learned fast that it was not safe to do so. Um, 68 is the year that we left Indiana. I could not stand it any longer. Um, in April, you know what happened. And a few months later, Robert Kennedy, who was came to deliver his great speeches on Indiana's campuses, and we were all out there in support, and the Klan was on the fringe, and then he went on to San Francisco. You know what happened. So that 68 was a very, 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 and I said, I've got to get out of here. i got to go back home. So my husband and I relocated back to Virginia. He was in radio television, and he was able to, he became the first black correspondent in the state of Virginia, working with Wavy, NBC. He started out working at the RCA factory in Bloomington, Indiana, at night. And one of the managers said, what is it you want to do? Because he was getting his undergraduate degree. He got his undergraduate degree in television and his graduate degree in um, theater. He said, what do you want to do? He said, I want to be on television. He said, give me your resume. Which he did, and we thought no more about it. But when we decided we've got to leave this area and came back to Virginia, he ended up working with an NBC affiliate in Portsmouth, Wavy TV. And then a few months later, he was called back to New York, which is where we ended up and where we, you know, we stayed. But we were always involved in, in protests. And as a photographer, I have gobs and gobs in black and whites of us protesting on Indiana's him. campus. Yes. And um, there was a young man that we were very close with that you may or may not have heard of. Um, um, we had a case in New York, the Tawana Brawley case. I don't know if you were aware of that or not. And there were three people who were very, very involved with the Tawana Brawley case in which she include, she accused various um, um, police enforcement people for having raped her. Mm-hmm. Al Sharpton was one, Vernon Mason was another, and there was a third, and they were her attorneys. Uh-huh. It all turned out to be, not to be true, but the only survivor out of that was Rel Mal. I mean, he's still very much on, but Vern was disbarred. But he was one of the prime, our close friends in Indiana, and he was very much involved in the protest you know, on the campus during the time that we were there. Yeah. Um, um, that's a lot of information. No, thank you for sharing that. Um, and so with you and your husband, you met back in, uh, I'm assuming here in uh, your graduate or undergrad? No, I left Howard and went to do graduate study when, at Indiana in, in Bloomington. He was a student there. Okay. And um, that's when we met. And you both worked together at uh, social movements, activism? 
Or would you well, say, was he involved as much as you? Well, probably well, not to that degree. But. My parents came out to my graduation when I got my master's in voice in June. Okay. And two days later, I met him, oh, wow. my husband. And a few weeks later, I married him. Wow. Wow. Love at first sight. <laughs> okay. Unbeno I mean, we, nobody knew anything about this person. And we um, ended up, and we were married for 53 years. Wow. But we were exhausted. Yeah. We had to. You know, right. but but we had we had a lot in common. He was from Nashville, Tennessee, lived close to the Fisk campus. He had a similar experience in Nashville. Most of his teachers, of course, um, that was the group that they got their masters and their PhDs. I mean, we had doctor, we had PhDs and masters. They couldn't get jobs. They so they taught in high schools. I mean, we had the best. System-wide, we had the best mm -hmm. of, and then so many, I know his community was decimated, as were so many of the communities were decimated uh, after the passage of the civil rights legislation and the great beautification program with the interstate highways. Most of the well-established mm -hmm. black neighborhoods were destroyed mm -hmm. by the interstate system. Mm -hmm. So there has been a systematic erosion. erosion. Yes of my community and it has been well planned and what has been demonstrated is patience is a virtue in terms of we can walk we can slow walk it down for as long as it takes and there are those of us within the community who strive and fight to ensure that our we leave a legacy that our children will be able to recognize because the same community that nurtured me no longer exists here. Our young people know nothing. I mean, do you think they really had emphasis on black, black history on Fridays in the classroom anymore? No. Not do you anymore. think that they, I mean, they associate St. Clair Walker High School with social services. They now go to, to there to get their whatever the vouchers are needed, they don't know what Sinclair Walker High School. And the Heritage Committee exists for the purpose of preserving and passing down the legacy of the black community within Queens, within Middlesex County, because it is, it's, it's, it's amazing. How can you reclaim uh, that again, once again? Can it be reclaimed? Can we go back to those states again? We, in are, we are involved in seeing to it that this happens. We are engaged in deep dive research together with the Fairfield Foundation. And um, it is going to take a while. There were a group of teachers and the Southern Baptist Association that wanted to stem the tide and to provide a basis for the children of the past to learn what the history of the middle of African Americans were in Middlesex County, that they engaged in the research and the development and the publication of a tome, and I should have brought the Red Book with me, that profiles the history of African Americans in Middlesex County starting around 1649. So that is a great basis from which we are working and we are building upon. I live in a community that was a free community of color but I don't know how it got to be that way. I'm gonna find out. Cook's Corner is a community of color. How did all of these black folks own all of this property that extends from Cook's Corner into Urbana? How did that happen? We're gonna find out. We had one entrepreneur that I remember, his wife in fact taught me as a seventh grader. His vision, the first thing that he did his name was Gerald Butler Harris. He had a baseball diamond. And the Negro National League used to come and play. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be interviewing the grandson of someone who played against Willie Mays in that same diamond. Mm -hmm. And once um, Jackie Robinson mm -hmm. was in, allowed into the National Leagues, then Gerald Butler Harris converted the baseball field into an outdoor movie 
And we would go to a drive-in movie there, and we'd have ads. And he had a new, he and his wife had a newspaper. And we have a few issues of the newspaper that we are pulling. I mean, it told about the life of the black community back in the 30s and the 40s. Um, the, um, I have paraphernalia. My grand, well, my papa, grandfather, he built the barn and the house that's over there where they live. Just a catacorded across from um, the high school. I have stories that he told where he would hang out at Cook's Corner. And it was the cultural and the educational center, one of them, of the black community. They had them in each community. I mean, the community surrounded the churches, and you had your social and your cultural and whatever. Um, we'll bring it back. We're going to ensure that these young people, even though I understand our numbers are declining within Middlesex County, we don't want to be certain that the full legacy and as much of the story as we can unearth can be unearthed. I mean, it's that the black families raise money to build the schools, that they had the land to donate so Sinclair Walker could be there, so that these little black children would learn how to read and write. And our grand, uh, my big mama, who uh, died at the age of 101, 102, um, they could put on plays. She read, she played, she knew how to read music. I don't, her mother Hannah, that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. saw to it that her children knew how to read music. Her mother Hannah and father Joshua, they had wills. Their educated children who had their masters and doctors and taught at the various universities. I, one, of the, um, one of my uncle, great uncles played football at Howard in 1909, wow. 1908. We had, they were the professors. I had a professor who, um, in Lancaster, he, his, he was, his educational background in terms of his teaching exposure, et cetera, was in Lancaster. Um, the children didn't know to do wills. The parents knew they didn't. So I had to deal with a lot of air property and take care of a lot of partition. And land was the value. And the young people now seem, many of them seem not to appreciate the value of land, as long as you have land. And if it's on the water, there are things you can do, like eat and sleep. Right. But it's being devalued, not important. We've got to reinforce that. Right. Do you see any type of reparations occurring, you know, because this is like the displacement of the community through whether it's highways, whether it's uh, integration, it seems that it wasn't uh, for this specific county, it wasn't something, an effective thing to do because that broke down the community. Clearly, I'm aware of the reparations movement and the drive and the, the, com the commitment. But, but that is not one of my focuses. Okay. That's my personal focus, and I have not had or been engaged in too much discussion locally where that has been the subject. So I, I cannot certainly speak to that. I would say that coming out of the Civil War, even prior to the Civil War, as the tome that I just described indicates, there were land, black landowners at that point in Middlesex County. And I am told, and it's oral history, that at the time that the um, Emancipation Proclamation, the ideal land for the white families was along the highway. Mm -hmm. So that all of the less desirable property, the waterfront property, ended up in the hands of the black families. But slowly but surely, that ownership has flipped. Um, I offer you $10,000 for land that's really valued at 100000 and that seems like a lot of money. I'll sell it to you. And that is what's happened. We now have limited access to any waterfront property around here, the black community. Now, if we want to speak in terms of reparations, mm -hmm. but it was voluntarily given. It was not taken.
Right. So that I don't know that what posture Middlesex County landowners would be to argue for. I don't know. I'm taking no position on that right. at all. Okay. Um, but oral history would suggest that maybe that's not a concept that may fly. Okay. Um, one of the questions I, I had uh, to add on to what we're talking about, um, we have the community, you know, one of the things is you could have cultural loss by the removal or, or the erasure of the history of those communities. And it seems to an extent it has occurred and you're trying to bring that back into the community. A lot of the conversations I've been hearing through yesterday, at least with a couple of the folks that we interview, they mentioned, you know, I think that's getting lost a lot around here, you know, mannerisms, the way that you're teaching your children to be, you know, you want the best for them, you want to educate them. But you also, behind that, there's the, there's, like I said, having those mannerisms, having this way of seeing the world, this world perspective that's sort of getting lost. So how do we reclaim that side of it? That side of uh, interacting with each other with, through those mannerisms, behaviors. And it's, uh, I don't know if that's sort of like speaking on the Southern sense, uh, you know, Southern folks are very man, when it comes with behaviors, mannerisms, it pushes the individual to uh, behave a certain way. But in, in that way, it's something that builds morality, it, it builds values, and it builds this uh, character that it's defined, well defined by themselves through their families. And it seems, you know, nowadays we're having children, you know, children are having children. And when you're having that, that's sort of, it, it's just disrupting that family dynamic of a stability. So how can we reclaim a sense of identity where, you know, you have, you, you empower the self more. And I'm trying to figure out here within the community, what, I don't want it to get erased. What are, how are the parents, what can they do? What can they do to keep those values going? Oh, I, I find that, that interesting. Um, and I'm going to kind of back around into this. Sure. There is the notion in terms of Middlesex County as of the come here person. Okay. Um, you are native or you are come here. Now, my father was here for almost 70 or 80 years. He came from North Carolina. He was a come here person. Um, I left here in 1960. And I did not return again until I came home to care for my mom in 2011. I'm basically now a come here person. There is an enormous void for me in terms of, I mean, I received the monthly papers, the weekly papers in New York. I came to visit my parents frequently. They came to visit me. But there is a void from 1960 to 2011. And from 2011 moving forward, I was pretty much engaged in caregiving. So I really was not out in the community. So it's only been since maybe 2018 that I have, and the passing of my husband, that I have now become more immersed in the community. What you are describing, that was described to you, um, I'm not a, a familiar with. I'm a come. I'm a come here person. I do know that I have reacted to what I have seen in publications. I, I, I feel saddened, for instance, that um, where I left here and we were at the top of the heap, and you see so, f you see maybe one or two black students who may be excelling. And new concepts have come into place. Right. You know, uh, I cannot remember when I was growing up, there may have been one or two children who may have had difficulty in a class. But it was not to the point that you were segregating out a certain group of students as being performing below par mm -hmm. or whatever. The mannerisms that were being recited, I'm not sure what, you know, what that is, is referencing. Um, I have had very limited interaction 
with young people from the community. Very, very limited. Because I'm an old woman. You're very young. You look- I'm, 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 an, I'm an old woman, and I am, have been the pandemic sent us inside. And most of the communications have been done by, by Zoom. And we've been able to get a whole lot done, but you are not interacting with on a one-to-one level with, with people. Right. So I don't even know how to, to address this. I can appreciate the concern. Certainly we want to have a return to the, uh, the niceties and so forth. But we are surrounded by, my sense is that we are surrounded by a lot of un- unniceties. There are preconceived notions that are brought in, that are associated with my people, that it's not true, but it's being fostered. Mm -hmm. So there is a negativism that is being associated with too many within within our community. I'm going to leave the rest unsaid. Okay. And said, I can say this, that during the period that I came through, it was the entrepreneurs, there was the people with professional knowledge that shaped our institutions. And as soon as one has the opportunity now to vacate the area, I think that's happening. And that you may be, the, there, there may be a less availability of people with knowledge that can inform the institutions that may have existed in the past. Mm-hmm. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. I think you brought a really good point er, uh, earlier, which is part of this project too, that I wanted to ask about the pandemic. What were the impacts in the community with the pandemic overall? The, from a personal perspective, the impact of the pandemic Um, was revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Um, I am a member of a a genealogy group, for instance. And we used to meet monthly in Essex. And it would be a relatively small group of people. Due to the programmatics of of the genealogy group, we now are an international group in which we, on a monthly basis, have participation from all over the world as people are seeking to find the connections between um, where I live in the Caribbean and where my folks may have lived in, in Louisiana or Virginia, because the middle migration we focused on substantially. So that in terms of the interactions, and we, the group is comprised of the slave, of the enslaved, as well as the enslaver. We have descendant populations who are seeking to find the people who were enslaved on their properties. And we have a lot, and we are finding the cousins are meeting each other, black and white are meeting each other. So that from the pandemic perspective, it has enlarged the world of many because of its ability to outreach The Heritage Committee has been meeting continuously via Zoom. And it's a safe way and we can talk and we can interact. One of the downsides of this region is the sparsity of Wi-Fi and so forth. Um, There was an isolation aspect of of the pandemic. Um, um, I had a personal experience in which for whatever, whatever reason, uh, the uh, Ellis Island Foundation um, decided they were going to commemorate me last year. So that, that not with, this was 20, what year? I'm talking too much. Um, um, but this necessitated my being traveling from Virginia to New York, interacting with the pandemic, there, because it was still raging, pretty much. Um, All of the things that had to be done to expedite my travel was a new concept. 
that was negative for me. Um, but on the positive side, I was able to do it. And people were there from all around the world to participate in the event. Um, it was exhilarating, and it took place notwithstanding the pandemic. Okay. With all safeguards in place, of course. Right. Um, so you was, we worked around many of the pitfalls of the pandemic right. to move forward ahead in non-event, in any event. All right. All right, Judge Satterfield, I know we're getting uh, close to time for the next interviews coming in, but uh, Mason, we'll ask a couple more questions and then we'll transition, okay? Okay. Go ahead. This is Mason. I have enough questions for another interview. So I'm gonna, I'll try to um, be a little selective. I'll try to be very much more succinct. <laughs> Well, I'm really, uh, I'm really interested in your musical background. You, um, you got really into classical music, correct? How I'm sorry. Did, you got really into classical music. That's what you studied. Yes, I was an operatic soprano. Did you, um, did you get, did you have records when you were a kid to listen to this stuff? Or how did you learn oh, yes. this music? Oh yes, we always had um, classical. We were not permitted to listen to rock and roll. Uh huh. Or blues even. Blues, yes. Jazz, okay. yes. Okay. Mama may have, daddy may have. God bless the child who has this. My mother was a singer. She had a, uh -huh. she has had a magnificent voice. So we listened to a lot of jazz, and they were they were just they were dancers. Mm -hmm. Of the jazz, um, was it just kind of like Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington, or did you listen to any um, like bebop or or the kind of the, I guess the harder? Well, I as a as a for piano, I had to learn a lot of the. Um, um, the honky tonk and type of thing. Really? Oh yeah, oh, because yeah. It's, it's the agility that it requires uh -huh. in the fingers, it was very, very good for that that purpose. Okay. Uh, but we we always listened to Carmen and the opera. My mother saw to it. We we had a subscription with National Geographic. Mm -hmm. We put out various albums. We always had albums that came every every month. And they and would be books. sent to you. Yes. Wow. And did you did you learn how to read music at an early age? And oh yeah. Sight read. Started around three, four years old. Wow, that's yeah. great. That's great. Uh, another thing, uh, in 1958, Sputnik happened, and your your teacher said we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do that soon. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you, did you enjoyed uh, we would call it STEM nowadays, but math and science. Oh, I did. So I did. did you did you pay attention to the space race during the 60s? I did. Mm -hmm. Did I you did. Like, gather around the TV to watch? Uh, well, I can them? remember that um, when the for the first walk in the moon, we were getting ready to. Well, I was getting ready to join my husband in um, New York, mm -hmm. and I can remember precisely where I was mm -hmm. and where I was visualizing the walk on the moon. Mm -hmm. My grandfather never believed it happened. Oh yeah. No, there were there was that generation that thought it was all made up. Never happened. So, so fast. Your your father um, he also served serviced the Pamunkey. Um, I'm sorry. Your your father serviced the Pamunkey Reservation mm -hmm. Indians for the for, for dentistry. Was there um, a lot of interaction with them in this in the middle? I can remember visiting with going with him to the um, you know, to the reservation. And he maintained a relationship up until his death. Mm -hmm. And his grandchildren, always, he took them to visit every summer, um, the chief and so forth. Did they mostly stick there? Did they ever come around the, the communities around here? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Aware of. They could have, but I wasn't aware of it. Mm -hmm. Moving ahead. God, I have so many. Oh, this is great. Um, how has uh, how has music changed in Middlesex County, and, or has it changed? Okay, that much? now when I was when my my mother was a music director for mm -hmm. various church choirs in Middlesex County, my big mama she was a had a strident soprano voice that you wanted to deep six, but she nonetheless had it. We always focused on the. Um, uh, well, the for the overtures, we did the Mendelssohn's. We did the because we had the first, we had the first pipe. I'm um, not pipe, buddy. Or uh, Harmon organ down here at Calvary, mm -hmm. and of course my sister and I knew how to play it, so they bought an organ. Um, we did anthems. Mm -hmm. We did spirituals. Um, we um, any type of sound effect that needed to be added would be added with the Hammond organ. 
you know, the piping and, and so forth. Um, communion was very reverent with the Lord's Prayer, the traditional um, church services. Well, that's where we had at Calvary, and folks used to talk about the high, the high services at Calvary. <sighs> folks don't read music anymore. No. They play from air. Mm -hmm. They have these electric pianos. True. They have the drums. Um, the congregation that I was a member of in New York, and I was um, church moderator for quite a number of years, and I performed in, in the choirs there. We had multiple choirs. We had the traditional, we had the uh, contemporary gospel, we had the realm, and there was an appropriate place for instrumentation, depending upon the choir. It's almost impossible, I have found, to find a service now that any way approximates the service that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. It's so different. And it's difficult for me to digest, mm -hmm. so I don't. Mm -hmm. Rachel? This is Rachel Hude. I have one question. Um, so when we're talking about spirituals and we're talking about the black church and music, um, how has all of that uh, been a part of your experience with the civil rights movement and organizing in general, the black church and um, its central role? The, the role of the black church can never be forgotten. Mm -hmm. It has been a potent force. In terms, in my opinion, in terms of the civil rights movements, and I say plural because there have been several, there were two driving forces major driving forces, the black college campus and the black churches. And it's out of that that much of your organizing took and takes place. And there is still reverence in terms of the community, and I don't, um, I, I, I do not um, seek to shortchange that at all. It still has a very definite force, and it depends on the congregation. I know many of the congregations are very involved in the social movements and social changes and have ministries directed expressly for those purposes. So I don't think that the black church will ever cease to be an important force for change. Did that come out correctly? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Did I answer your question? Yes, ma'am. I guess if you want to uh, add to it, how is it personally being that you, I'm not a musical person, so how is it personally um, when you when you are performing or going ahead and actually um, using those instruments, how has it personally motivated you? Do you find well, the, like, the, the history of black music um, is a whole cultural type of thing of its own being. And, and, and for a brief period, I was, I was a music teacher. And as I would introduce my classes to the concept, I said, you start out with the howling in the fields as the slaves were using, or the enslaved, were incorporating music that they may have a memory of from Africa, that they may have a memory of, of having heard some of the people sing silently around the river as they are preparing for church. All of that is an amalgamation. It comes out as jazz, blues, and many of the black composers have incorporated many of those elements in and may black music never be lost because it is certainly identifiable. And it is also, um, capable of integrating so many of the j traditional genre within, the, within black music, but may it never be lost. I mean, may we always be able to embrace our own individual cultures, mm -hmm. embrace them and uplift them. Yep. And what happens too frequently now I'm seeing is a, a, set, a attempt to demonize my culture to demonize my practices. And you may find in your experiences that there are some elements of that that is intruding. And I see it's coming as a result of fear, out of fear, and which is a, an emotion that should not be built upon. Mm -hmm. 
Um, did I answer your question? Yes. If we have time for one, one more kind of big one, I guess, is uh, so you mentioned that over the course of the 1960s, you're meeting with Stokely Carmichael. You're talking, you know, you're working with him, and um, you you say you turned against the black the black bourgeoisie. Well, we verbalized. Mm -hmm. Let's just say, let's be honest about this. I mean, we talked about it. Mm -hmm. We talked about our parents. Yeah. But we embraced many of the lovely things that we were, we were beneficiaries. Well, that's what of. I wanted to ask is. Um, how, how have your views changed since the, like 1968, since the, from the later, yeah? I never want to lose my black identity. I have fought to ensure, notwithstanding raising my child in New York, that she be fully aware of her black identity. Mm -hmm. I am, there are cultural differences. We are not a homogeneous community when I'm saying black identity. And there are, there are differences in views. There are cultural differences. There may be cultural biases and so forth. If I were to re rule anything, it would be the fact that there is the clamor on the part of some to be wanting to equate or to duplicate or replicate for my family what's going on in the white family so that we are forgetting what our identity is. Harvard Law School is wonderful, but so is Howard Law School. Mm -hmm. HBCUs provided an opportunity for black students to achieve when they were rejected everywhere else. Do not minimize the importance of the HBCUs. They will never be supplanted by the Harvard or the Yale that, that offers enormous things. We're celebrating in New York because we now have, for the first time in history, as the head of the Court of Appeals, the chief judge of the Court of Appeals of the state of New York is a black judge mm -hmm. who happens to have a Harvard Law degree. So I don't minimize that, but we have to be fully embracive of the positive benefits of association. I am strong because I came through an HBCU. And that Indiana professor who told me, Paulson, you may have an A in my class, but no nigga's gonna get an A out of my class. And I responded in, in kind. Because I had the confidence from the building at an HBCU and Sinclair Walker High School mm -hmm. to know what my worth is. Mm -hmm. And I got an A out of the class. Wow. And he had to appear before the dean. Wow. Okay. So that it's never to be, never to be assumed that the HBCUs or any black oriented group that is moving forward in a positive vein should be disregarded or dismissed. Well, do you have anything else you'd like to tell us? Oh, I have a whole lot of stuff I'd like to <laughs> yeah, do. No, but I, think, yeah. I think that I have, have really exhausted, and my coffee's getting cold. No, that's you good. only touched like the tip of the iceberg before we get going through all this. I feel like we need another side interview, but I mean, for now, I think we have already an interview previously. Uh, I think the first interview may have focused more on Hannah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and. Um, we could, uh, like I said, we're going to be here, you know, for a little bit longer. But I mean, for now, I th we have other people coming in. But I want to thank you for making time today and sharing with us very in-depth details about your personal life and also about the things that you've gone through throughout the years. And thank you for all the work that you're doing here. Um, this is what we need, in my in my opinion. This is what needs to happen. We need folks, the community, to come back and pick up 
and rebuild that history, build, uh, remind people what happened here, what occurred here, yes. that erasure needs to stop happening. And I think by you identifying what needs to be done and get done, um, I think that's a step forward. That's a step back to reclaiming that uh, identity that you mentioned that is necessary for the community to move forward. So I want to thank you for doing that. Well, I appreciate this, and I, I appreciate what you do. Thank you. And wish you a whole lot of luck luck in continuing to do so. And you're becoming so familiar with Middlesex, you have to come back. I will. I promise. I will. Down the road, I will come back. Oh, wonderful.